today's video is going to be on my latest blog post which is 10 my top 10 tips for glazing um, I'm going to be throwing some large swirly mugs you might have noticed my laser is now green I've got a video explaining my new laser but uh, this one's slightly better than the last um, I'm going to be throwing with very soft clay just because it's a new bag of the light clay and I've just been throwing with the very stiff dark clay so this clay always throws me so my throwing might not be its best but um, I'll, I'll try to <laughs> throw and talk at the same time so the blog post goes into all of these in more detail but I'll just kind of talk you through the main points of it so the, the top 10 tips in order are to test everything so test 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 uh, pay attention to the thickness weigh the application of glaze understand your glazes make the most of your test tiles don't rush be consistent prepare your bisqueware let the pieces dry first and use drip catches um, so some of those are fairly self-explanatory but some of them really aren't the testing Basically what you want to do is you want to know what your glaze will look like under a range well you want to know what your glaze will look like under a range of conditions. It's not essential but it, it does help you find out what a glaze is going to do. So if you've got a glaze and you know how it behaves and you're not interested in it doing anything different then you feel free to ignore this. But if you are starting out with a new glaze and you want to see what it does then I would recommend testing it at a range of thicknesses um, on any surface that you think you might use so mine are generally ribbed smooth but I do have the drippy slip as well uh, if you did any other form of texture on your pieces you'd want to test on that as well just basically any condition from super smooth to really rough texture that you think there's a probability of you actually using you want to know what a glaze will do on that uh, next one is what it will do on all of the clays that you'll use assuming you use more than one clay so I was saying this is my light clay I have a light and a dark clay and then I use coloured slips as well so you really want to know what a glaze will look like over each of those um, depending pretty much on the transparency of the glaze um, it will do either something quite dramatic or nothing a very opaque glaze won't really change much between clays um, just because the clay is not showing through whereas um, something like my sunset glaze which is fairly transparent and changes based on thickness is completely different over light and dark just because it's a well yeah I'll, I'll put pictures up but you'll, you'll see um, it's basically the clay showing through makes the difference and so you want to know what your glazes will do on different clays um, in combination, I mean, there's glazes don't necessarily do what you think when you combine them, assuming you're used to kind of mixing paints and colour theory. It is not necessarily the case that you combine a red glaze and a blue glaze and you get a purple glaze. In fact, unless you're using stains, that probably won't happen. Just because they're so sensitive to the chemistry and if the glaze is mix when you combine them, well I say combine, I mean layer, but when they melt in the kiln glazes really have two options and that's to stay separate so you get something like an oil spot glaze where the, you can use a, a dark oil spot glaze and a white cover glaze and it bubbles up through so they don't mix to make a kind of muddy brown they stay separate and distinct and create a pattern uh, other glazes when you combine them will combine and the chemistry will sort of amalgamate to become a new chemistry and do something other than what you expect most of the time. So it's worth knowing what the glazes do in combination. Some are great, some aren't. 
As a general rule, if you want glazers that do interesting things when they're in combination, look for glazers that have a decent amount of titanium in, because they generally, it's described as an effect additive, because it's an opacifier, but it also makes things phase separate and move in an interesting way and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the trick to the glazers that I use in combination one of them or both of them tend to have titanium in um, and you get a more interesting result from that. Not always the case but generally. Um, kiln location, either not important at all for most glazers other than possibly you might have hot and cold spots and you'll get more or less heat work depending on whether you kiln, like you get gradients so different shelves will be hotter. Um, very important for crystalline glazes. So the uh, campfire glaze that I've been working with recently, there's a microcrystalline glaze. Um, if I put the pieces on the bottom shelf, they overcrystallize. Now there are a couple of possible explanations for that, and I haven't done enough testing to rule out um, any one of them because I don't really care, I know where I need to put the pieces to get the result that I want. But um, it could be that the bottom shelf is cooler because crystalline glazes care about that. And it could be that the cooling is at a different rate because that matters too. So it, it could be one of a number of factors and you could adjust your firing or kiln layout to try and um, accommodate that and get the same either heat or cooling rate on each shelf but you'll never do it perfectly so it's worth knowing if you've got a glaze that's going to be sensitive to it test on each shelf in the same firing and see what you get because you might well find that you like it one place but you don't like it anywhere else uh, and then finally test at different scales so it's all well and good having a glaze you like on test tile but quite often it won't translate exactly the way you want it to um, to a full size piece. So keep any junk pieces you have or throw very quick tumbler kind of things um, for testing at a larger scale than a test tile. And if it's going to be going on a mug um, something like a tumbler is perfect because um, how glazes behave around the rim where they overlap on the inside or outside of a rim can often be different to how you get in a test tile. Um, so it's worth knowing that because if a glaze is going to pull away and you're going to get crawling it's probably going to do it on the inside of the rim in my experience. That's sort of where glazes end up thickest and on a surface where when they pull away they really pull away. Um, so yeah, test at different scales. Uh, the great thing about tumblers, and I've posted about this before, but if you um, think about displacement, something round with no handle, you can plunge into a container of glaze that's the same, that's just a fraction bigger than it and also round. And what happens is it displaces the glaze as you push it in. So you can use 100 mil of glaze and dip something with a capacity of 200 mil so you're basically, you've got a container, a piece that's much bigger than the amount of glaze you've got, but because it displaces the glaze, you can dip it in it. That makes sense. If it doesn't, I'll see if I can find an old video to link to for that one. Um, yeah, so you want to be testing all of those things for any glaze that you want to fully kind of get your head around. You don't have to know all of those things for all of your glazes, but um, if you're having issues with any of your glazes, those are the sort of things you want to know. Uh, a huge one is the thickness of the glaze. So clear glazes benefit generally from being thin because then you don't get bubbling and you don't get haziness. Those are all kind of qualities that uh, increase with the thickness of the glaze. So if you want, when I do my drippy slippy pieces, they're covered in a thin, well, they're covered in clear and I try and get it on as thinly as possible because it gives the same effect with none of the issues. Um, 
some glazes need to be thick and if it's uh, a translucent glaze like Sunset it would be really obvious but thin is also okay. Some glazes like my floating blue the movement comes from the thickness so if you're testing one of my glazes that looks like it moves a lot and you're not getting movement it's probably not thick enough um, and I think that's probably the number one mistake I see when people use my glazes on glazy is that they are not putting them on thick enough and you can see it on the test tile if you look at my test tiles there's often kind of a bead of glaze around the bottom and if your test tile you, you don't get that at all and in fact you can almost see the texture because the glaze is so thin that it hasn't even become glossy across the whole surface you know that's it's almost painfully thin and the glaze never stood a chance so if you're testing a glaze that should move and you're not getting movement and it looks like it's too thin it's you practically guarantee it is um, so my third point is relevant to that which is weigh your glaze application so a lot of people talk about specific gravity and dip time which are two ways of getting at this idea basically the important thing is not any of those measurements but how much glaze you've got on a piece that's what you really want to get at so you can tell from the specific gravity the density of it which generally goes hand in hand with the thickness so how watery it is uh, the viscosity, all those things. Basically, the density is a measure almost of how much water you've added. The more water you've added, the thinner it will go on. That's why people care about specific gravity. The problem is it doesn't always track. So different glazes need different specific gravities, and the specific gravity that you want the glaze at can change over time as it kind of gels up a bit and uh, so on and so forth. So. It's a way of, it's an easy way of measuring, but it doesn't get to the heart of what you actually want to know, which is how much glaze you're putting on a piece. Same with dip time. Um, it, if you keep these things consistent for you, for a certain glaze, for a certain type of piece, then you can get fairly consistent results from it. But if you're trying to compare with other people's results, um, these numbers don't really help much. Whereas, if you measure your piece, before and after adding a glaze or what I do is I zero the scales to it so I don't have to remember the first number but I just know that I've added so for example when I add glaze to the inside of my mug this is a large mug this would get 27 and a half grams ish of floating blue and by the time that's covered the inside and that's um, wet weight so that's with 100 grams of water per in fact, a little over 100 grams of water per 100 grams of base mix. So you need to track the water and then weigh your application. And with those two numbers, you know how much glaze you've put on the inside of a piece exactly. Um, and <clears throat> with that information, you will be able to consistently get the same results over time. Uh, it's basically as easy as measuring specific gravity because all you're doing is measuring something. You're just putting it on scales. Uh, for those that don't know, specific gravity is um, measured by taking a, a known capacity and weighing it, as you'd expect with density. Um, but the thing with specific gravity is it's relative to the density of water, essentially, because it's um, grams per cubic centimetre, where water is one gram per one cubic centimetre. So something with a specific gravity, if one is equivalent to pure water, and then as you add glaze ingredients, it will go up. So most glazes are around 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, something like that. Which means that for every cubic centimetre, it's 1.3 to 5 grams. Um, and that's because the glaze ingredients add to the density because they're denser than water. That's basically the premise. So what you tend to do is you measure out uh, 50 or 100 mil of something and weigh it. And that gives you the specific gravity. My contention is you're better off just weighing the piece rather than getting the specific gravity. Some people like it. Having both numbers is never going to be a bad thing. You can measure viscosity with a viscosity cup, which is basically something you put the glaze in and it pours out through a, a known size of hole. Uh, and based on the time that it takes to empty 
a given volume, you know how viscous it is, because obviously the thicker something is, the slower it flows. Again, a useful number for some respect, but still doesn't matter once the piece is in the kiln. The only thing that matters once the piece is in the kiln is how much glaze is on it. So I say weigh your glaze application. Um, next point was understand your glazes. So everything mentioned in the testing section, you want to know um, to fully understand your glaze. But also the kind of the extension of that is the glaze chemistry. Um, I talk about them a lot more on Instagram than on here, but uh, Ceramic Materials Workshop is where I learned my glaze chemistry and I highly, highly recommend it. You can get 25% off the Cone 6 course, which is great. Um, I would recommend if you're firing Cone 6, take the Cone 6 course or take the full Understanding Glazes course, the more expensive one with the um, lectures and the labs. Uh, sorry, not lectures, the hangouts and the labs because that goes into more depth. Uh, the Cone 6 course is sort of an abridged version of that. And I think the the labs and the hangouts do add to that course. So if you're going to do that one, do the full thing or do the Cone 6 one. Fortunately, uh, the discount code that I have doesn't work for the full thing. But um, yeah, you can get 25% off. didn't quite get the height I wanted from that second pull. Um, yeah, and the thing with understanding the glaze chemistry is when things start to go wrong or they're not quite behaving the, the way you want, that's when it's really useful. You don't need it if you've got a glaze recipe, you mix it and it does exactly what you want every time. Where it's really useful is when you can't get an ingredient or you find a recipe well, yeah, that uses essentially when you want to substitute ingredients or when you want to troubleshoot, that's when it gets really useful. Um, and so I would highly recommend that if you're mixing your own glazes and you're in any way interested in understanding them, take a ceramic materials workshop course. Um, next one is make the most of your test tiles. This kind of goes back to the first point again about all the variables you want to test. Um, but basically the, my point here is that you can test a bunch of them in a single test tile. So what I do is I rib mine smooth and then add slip to them for texture. So you get a smooth portion and then somewhere for the glaze to pull. And I also add coloured slip to the reverse. So on a single test tile I'm getting a few different bits of information. Um, what you test on them will depend on what you want to know. So if you use several different clays, you could use several of them in a firing. If you use texture or whatever, you know, use it for your glazes, underglaze, oxide washes, whatever. You know, do whatever makes sense for you, but there's no point in firing a test tile that's the same front and back and you get no extra information from it when you can have more of this information uh, for essentially the same cost. You might as well do it. Um, don't rush. This is a huge one because everyone does it. I do it all the time. I did it last week or the week before with my Halloween uh, special mugs that I wanted to get out for the last shop update. I tested the glazes in combination but I wasn't I hadn't tested them that thoroughly and I picked from two options that had been tested but not tested fully. I picked which one I wanted to do all the mugs in and in retrospect I probably should have done the other one. And with an extra week to get them prepared I would not have made that mistake. I was rushing and as a result they were I wasn't happy with any of them. So um, don't be me. I've done this enough times that I should have learnt by now and I still haven't and I imagine the same is going to be true for most people. Um, very tempting to rush, almost never a good idea. And in a similar vein, if you've got a one-off piece, if you've thrown something that's uniquely big or uniquely interesting, um, there is always that temptation to try a combination of glazes that you've never tried before because in your head it looks amazing and you think 
why would I want to glaze it in a boring combination that I use all the time? Um, so you consider um, using something you don't know how it's going to look, so it will be extra exciting when it comes out of the kiln. The problem is that I would say 9 times out of 10 it's not exciting. When it comes out of the kiln it's disappointing. And again this is one that I should have learnt by now and still make this mistake. But don't use untested combinations on a piece that you're not happy to throw away because there's a fair chance that you will hate how it looks and you will want to throw it away afterwards. But I say that both of those things knowing full well I'm going to make the same mistakes again and you probably will too. Um, be consistent. So obviously there's consistency in how you apply your glazes. Um, I mean every part of that is kind of important how long you leave between coats of glaze. So if you're dipping two glazes and you dip them back to back, don't then do one where you walk away and go and have lunch between them because it will take up a different amount of glaze on the second dip, that sort of thing. Two that you might not kind of picture when I say it but are quite important are your bisque firing temperature because essentially the porosity of your bisque ware is related to the clay and the bisque temperature. The hotter your bisque, the less porous the clay will be. Meaning that if your bisque temperature varies, your dip times would have to vary too. And obviously if you're measuring your glaze then to a certain extent it doesn't matter, but you have to take that into account. Um, and it's obviously much easier to just keep your bisque the same if you can. So. Yeah, stick with one bisque temperature, um, or be aware that that will change if you do change your bisque temperature. And the other one is how you prep your glazes. If you do your glaze tests with an immersion blender and your full mixes with a, a slower drill mixer and a sieve, which is what I did briefly, um, you will find that certain ingredients, titanium in particular, and also tin seems to be sensitive to it, um, get broken up far more by the immersion blender so they become smaller particles dispersed through the glaze the glaze will behave differently. So you get a glaze that you're perfectly happy with in test and then as soon as you do a full mix it's not the same. That's possibly why. So you can get around it by if you're going to do that just before you add all of the rest of the glaze ingredients to a big mix immersion blend just the titanium and the tin and I'm not sure what other ingredients are sensitive to it but it seems to be a thing that you have to be aware of. Um, so if that, if you've done that, if you've immersion blended your tests and then your glaze isn't working, one of those ingredients might well be sensitive to that. So again, consistency, probably not something you've thought of, it's not something I'd considered, um, but then I hadn't been using an immersion blender for very long before I noticed it and was kind of, it was reinforced to me by um, Ryan from Midnight Ceramics. That's another thing to be aware of. Um, prepare your bisque ware. Very quick one, just don't handle it with oily hands. Wipe off any dust and check for sharp bits because if there's a sharp bit on a rim or a handle, um, as in like a little chunk of clay or a spiky bit, and you don't sand it off or don't remove it in the greenware or bisqueware stage and you glaze over the top of it, chances are you're going to have a very sharp spike through your glaze and the piece will be useless. So get in the habit of checking them, preferably before loading them into the bisque kiln because then you can, kind of when it's greenware, you can just take off a high point incredibly easily. When it's um, been bisqued, then you need to use sanding pads or, or similar but um, still preferable to risking an entire piece just having to be thrown away. So that's important but not particularly huge time factor. Let your pieces dry. I glaze them the day before I want to load them in the kiln just because you don't want water going into your kiln anyway. It's not great for the kiln. But also, if the water isn't fully out of the piece by the time the temperature starts to climb to significantly above boiling point, 
uh, it's quite possible that it will take some of the adherence of the glaze to the clay with it when it goes so it will steam out of it and it will loosen the bond that your glaze has as a powder to the piece and you're more likely to get crawling it's just not worth it um, it's bad all round if you have to do it candle which is where you have to kiln at a fairly low temperature for like an hour before I do 100 C for an hour before climbing up to a high temperature which means that all the pieces are not quite at boiling but they can dry very quickly at that rate so I get rid of the last of any water and there will be a little bit of water because the air is humid so the pieces don't lose all of it uh, but particularly if it's cold or humid that is something to be aware of and yeah don't rush pieces into the kiln if you don't have to because again tends not to end very well uh, and then finally protect your kiln shelves I use drip catchers if you think a glaze will run put it on something a lot of people use uh, just slabs of clay called cookies I throw my drip catchers I'll, there's a link to the video on the blog I'll put it again in the comments but we'll throw in drip catchers with a raised centre which allows a little bit of a gap between the piece and or where the glaze will come down of the piece and the clay by supporting the centre it means a drip can come just past the bottom without sticking and ruining the piece um, not essential, definitely not essential on all pieces I don't use them on the ones that I know aren't going to run or if they do run I've got a much bigger problem uh, but some glazes have a tendency or have a risk of running um, and those ones I always put a drip catcher under just because it saves the shelf and quite often saves the piece too uh, and even if you can grind your shelves back afterwards no one likes doing that the shelves end up all pockmarked and you can't slide things around them uh, it's just you know it's best to avoid that if you can and it's a fairly trivial thing to make them so always do that and assume any untested glaze will run because quite often they do um, and again it's just not worth ruining a shelf for so very conveniently that was it for balls of clay and that was it for blog post points I'm not entirely happy how, with how I was throwing today but it's up there alright so hopefully that was useful um, go read the blog post if any point of that didn't make sense because that will expand on them further um, and then there's links to click on in the blog post I'll post the important ones in the comments but anything yeah, come. if you're looking for a link go to the blog post because it will almost certainly be there um, and yeah let me know if there's anything I've got a, a section at the bottom where I'm adding s suggestions that other people have kind of given me so at the moment it's Instagram and Reddit if you want to leave any in the comments here I'll edit any in that um, kind of I feel haven't been covered enough already so yeah let me know your close tips and I'll edit them into the main thing and click in the links to get to the actual blog post.